My god, it's a miracle. I actually enjoyed this episode. <laughs> uh, it's not perfect, obviously there's things I'm gonna talk about, but I had a good time watching this one. And it's the season finale, so it's a very good thing that I enjoyed that one. One of the more important episodes. <clears throat> if the whole series had been as enjoyable to watch as this episode was, I would have loved this show. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, um, unfortunately was not the case. I disliked most of the episodes of the season. And I know some of you guys have problems with that, but, you know, let me make something clear. My opinion doesn't have to be your opinion. You can enjoy the show whether I like it or not. I have my own thoughts, and I'm I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to just tell you what I know you want to hear. <laughs> some people say, oh, you're the only YouTuber who doesn't like the show. Okay, well, I guess that's what I am then. <laughs> and uh, you know what? It means the other people who don't like the show have somewhere to go. I know you're out there, people who don't enjoy the Percy Jackson show. Come out of the shadows. You have a place here. <laughs> Uh, but I did like this episode. I liked the finale. It was it was pretty fun, and uh, I laughed a couple times. And honestly, um, like I was watching it with Shannon Claire, and a lot of the time we'll like roast an episode while we watch it. I think we were the most quiet during this episode because we were just you know watching it. <laughs> we were just like, oh, this is kind of fun. So that's good, good plus. Uh, and uh, hopefully, when season two happens, and we know it will happen, um, it'll be more like this. Um, the, the, the only, there are a couple problems with the episode, one of which just being a problem that was created in earlier episodes, which really shouldn't have happened, the stupid missing the deadline thing. But I liked, um, I liked the encounter with Ares. Again, the, the Edge, very well cast. I feel like he loves playing this role. He's playing it really well. He's like, it, it makes Ares feel straight out of the book, come to life. I, I wish we'd gotten the fire for eyes. We didn't get that. But I, I don't have to have that to be happy. I just would have liked it. I still liked him without it, but still, would have been cool. Would have been pretty cool. Again, I think they should have had the fire during his reveal. I think he should have shown up with glasses and they not know who he is and he takes the glasses off and you see the fire. And then they're like, oh my god, that's Ares. And then you could just have a moment where he like blinks and it, they turn to normal eyes. I think that would have been a cool little hint to the book. But either way, um, love the edge. I, I love the sword Ares has. Looks really cool. Um, the fight between uh, him and Percy was fun. He, there's this funny part where he knocks Percy down, and I said out loud, kick him. And then he did kick him. And I was like, hey, he did it. <laughs> um, and then Percy uses his water powers to take take uh, Ares down and draw first blood from him. They've got the golden ichor of the gods. Uh, finally, after, if you've seen my inaccuracy videos, you know my thoughts on that. And uh, yeah, obviously I like that Percy doesn't have to completely defeat Ares. He just has to draw first blood because that makes a little more sense. And he uses his water powers to do it. Um, honestly, uh, on only nitpick about the fight is I wish it had gone on a little longer because I was enjoying watching it. So I wanted more of it. That's That's the only thing. Um, but, you know, for what it was, it was pretty good. I also wish we had uh, gotten the line after Ares is defeated where Ares says, like, gives Percy a little, like, war god's curse. He says, your sword will fail you when you need it most in the book. But they don't have that in the movie. Um, what I think it would have been cool in, like, foreboding to have that... <laughs> movie, what am I saying? We don't have that in the show. I think it would have been a little cool in foreboding to have that line in the show. It's like, ooh, when's that gonna happen? Like, I remember when I read the book, I was like, ooh, when's that gonna happen? And, you know, it's, uh, I, I just think it would have been a little cool. And it doesn't take much to do that. You just have the actor say one more sentence. But either way, still liked it. Um... <clears throat> The way the helmet looked, I thought, was pretty cool when it was revealed. Um, uh, I like the bolts design a lot better, but the, the helmet's pretty cool for what it is. I think you could have made it a little cooler, but again, it's fine for what it is. I liked when the Fury showed up. She now has no more animosity towards Percy because she realizes he was innocent the whole time. That's Again, that's just like the book, you know? The only reason the Furies have, like, been so violent towards Percy is because they think he stole the helmet. So once she realizes he didn't, she's like, okay, yeah, thanks for giving that back. Good luck on Olympus. You know, it's nice. It's a nice moment. I liked it. Um, you know, one nitpick I have about this entire show is what the hell was Grover for? 
on the show. In the book, he has moments where he helps them, but this, come on, we can all admit it's a problem that Grover throughout this entire show is just a burden. What, when has he ever helped with anything? The only thing he ever did was figure out incorrect information about who stole the bolt, right? Am I wrong? If, if, did I miss something where Grover was really helpful in the show? Because as far as I know, he has just been useless and a burden and constantly told to leave or shut up or getting eaten by Cerberus and losing a pearl. He has been nothing but a problem the whole show, as far as I remember. They kind of ruined his character, in my opinion. Like... You know, people people say in the Harry Potter movies they ruined Ron Weasley. I don't think they ruined him, but he's definitely way more badass in the book. But I think Ron at least still had some moments to shine in the movies. First Harry Potter movie, you know, the chess scene, at least it's like, oh, he was essential for that. In the show, Grover is worthless the whole show. But maybe I'm forgetting something. You guys are more than welcome to help me, like, remember that. <clears throat> um, When Percy went to Olympus... I, I, another scene I wish they had included, because I thought it was funny in the books, and a, a, a kind of funny reveal, is when he goes up to the desk clerk, and he's like, I need to go to the 600th floor, and the clerk's like, there's no such floor, and he says, I need to see Zeus, and the clerk says, Zeus doesn't see anyone without an appointment. I remember thinking, yeah, that's a funny way to reveal it. And then he pulls out the bolt. In this, he just shows up, goes right to the desk clerk, and pulls out the bolt. And it's like, what if that clerk didn't know about Greek mythology? Like, you're kind of taking a big chance on that, but okay. And when he goes up to Olympus, I I really liked how Olympus looked. I, I thought it was designed pretty creatively. It did look uh, like the architecture was pretty cool. And, um, like, one thing, um, I don't remember if it was Shane or Claire who said the background looks a little too much 2D, like, in the CGI. But for me, I, I can definitely see how that'd be a problem. But for me, personally, I was looking at it and I was like, I see that, but it... Because it's like that, it reminds me of, like, like a painting of, like, Greek mythology. And as a huge mythology enthusiast, I liked that. I, it, it was fun to be reminded of that. So I didn't have a problem with that. Um, when, when he gets to the top of Mount Olympus where all the thrones are, it looks like the three main thrones look different from each other. But the rest of the thrones, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they all looked kind of rinse and repeat. I wish each individual throne had looked really different. Like, you can tell just by looking at them which one belongs to which god. And yeah, like, isn't Hera's throne supposed to be golden? Like, none of the thrones were golden, unless I'm incorrect here. But, like, yeah, Zeus's looked, like, bigger than the others as it should, and it looked like the ones on either side of his were different. But I would have liked a little more variety in the thrones. That's the main thing. <clears throat> They, uh, they cast Lance Reddick to play Zeus. This is an actor I really like. Um, un like, unfortunately, he passed away. It's it's sad. And I, I liked at the end it was in loving memory of Lance Reddick. Uh, of course they're going to write that, but it's still nice to see it. <sighs> um, Lance Reddick as Zeus, though. The thing is, when I picture Zeus, I think of, the, you know, the beard and the hair and all of that. So, like, Lance Reddick, you know, he's very clean-shaven and, you know, no hair at all. So... If you showed, if, like, let's be honest here, if anyone showed you that, like, image of Lance Reddick out of context and said, which god is that, you would never guess Zeus. So, I, I, I kind of wish it was either someone who looked more like Zeus or they'd done a little more effort to make him look like Zeus. I think, I think I see why they cast him, though. He has the presence, you know? He, Lance Reddick commands authority. He's very... He's got a really just buttery, lovely voice, you know, when he talks, it's like, oh, yes. <laughs> and, you know, the way he carries himself, his posture, like, I, I get that stuff. You know, honestly, though, and, I and I'm serious when I say this, I think he would have made a wonderful book-accurate Charon. I'm not just saying that because of John Wick. If you've read the books, you know Charon, like, is a, is a little, like, intimidating and constantly dresses in three-piece suits. I think Lance Reddick, with the way he carries himself in his voice, would have been, like, wonderful for that scene. Um, but no, uh, instead he's playing Zeus, and, well, they're obviously gonna have to recast since he tragically passed away. Um... Uh, I remember some people were mad about the race change. I get that. You can chalk that up to the gods' shapeshift a lot, though. And again, they're going to have to do that because they're going to have to recast him. Uh, too bad we lost him. He he was a really entertaining actor. It's really sad. Um, 
And but yeah, when Percy gives the bolt to him, there's the scene I I both was on board with and wasn't on board with because they did this stupid thing that there was no reason to do where, oh, you missed the deadline, it's too late, They're, the gods are going to war with each other. I was like, why would you do that? If that's the case, Percy should already be dead. I'm sorry, my camera's gone down a little. Let me lift that up a little. Okay, if that's the case, Percy should already be dead. He should have already been struck down by Zeus. Like, what's Zeus afraid of? Starting a war with Poseidon? There's already a war with Poseidon. It's stupid. Like, why would you do this missing the deadline thing? And, uh, yeah, it's just so... So when Percy gives Zeus the bolt and tells him about Kronos, which, you know, makes sense. It's good that Percy would tell Zeus all that. Zeus is like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, we'll deal with that. But first I have to continue my war with your father. It's like, what? <laughs> Why would you, like, what's, what is to be gained from that? And on one, on the one hand, I can believe Zeus would be that dumb and stubborn, like, he's being incredibly stubborn. But on the other hand, this is really dumb and stubborn. And, um, yeah, Percy's just got such an attitude with Zeus in this, which I didn't fully like, because I think it's just, it, let me explain why. It's because this is Percy's first time meeting a god like this. I would have liked it if Percy was a little more intimidated. You know, I would have liked it if, you know, he was a little more, God, I don't know what to say. I've never, like, dealt with, like, someone on this level before. It's, and he commands authority. He has this imposing presence, as Hades should have. But anyway, um, so it, it just felt a little off to me that he showed up and immediately had an attitude with him. I know at the end of the fifth book, Percy, you know, makes a big ask at the end of it, but I, but that felt more earned because that's the end of the fifth book, you know? Like, I, I want I want that confidence to build over time, not just exist from the start. It's, you know, it's part of character growth, in my opinion. If I was a freaking 13-year-old kid and I met Zeus, I don't know how the hell I'd react. Um... I did like, though, uh, so obviously when he has an attitude with Zeus, Zeus tries to kill him for a second, but then Percy's father immediately shows up and stops him. That I liked, and, but then there's this line where Poseidon just immediately says, I surrender, so that means the war is over. I'm like, wait, that's all it takes? What was the threat to begin with, then? What, what, what was ever, what would have happened if you had, if you had not gotten the bolt and you surrendered? I mean, I, I don't know, maybe you would have killed Percy or something, but... I don't know, but I did like, um, the when Poseidon and Zeus were talking to each other, I was like, you know, this does feel like two gods talking, and I like the way they talk, and they start speaking in ancient Greek when they talk. I loved that. That was actually, I was like, oh shit, this is really cool, and it makes it feel more mythical, you know? That was a great choice, very good choice. Um... Yeah, and I liked how Zeus, just like in the book, is like giving Poseidon shit for having a forbidden child. But of course, Poseidon in the show is like, you know, you had a kid too, right, Zeus? Yeah, totally fair thing to bring up. Um, and so then eventually, yeah, he talks Zeus out of it. And then Poseidon has a one-on-one -on -one with Percy, which I also liked. It, it felt like a nice little conversation. The guy playing Poseidon is great, and it, like his acting is very good. Would have liked the Hawaiian shirt, but no such luck. But even so, really liked um, the conversation they had, and, you know, the way you can see that he loves Percy and everything. I kind of wish they had talked a little longer, though, because Poseidon cuts the conversation so short, and I don't know why he would do that. Like, is there a reason to cut it so short? Um, I really don't know. But I would have liked it if they talked a little longer, and I would have liked it if Poseidon gave him a hug. If you know Book Poseidon, that feels like something he would do. But no, instead he grabs a pearl and just goes, boom, get out of here. <laughs> um, but they do have a nice talk before that, so it, it is kind of cool. And I like some of the, you know, uh, metaphors he uses, like where he says, Percy, you have an issue with authority, but, you know, I should take the blame. That's the ocean for you. The ocean does not like to, you know, obey. And it's like, eh, it's a fun thing to say. Um, then, uh, let's see, was the camp thing first or the mom thing first? I think the, uh, um, no, I think the camp thing was first. Yeah, um, so then Percy goes back to the camp, Annabeth hugs him immediately, which it, I liked, you know, showcases their dynamic. And then, yeah, they talk about the Clarice thinking she stole the bolt thing, which again, 
added nothing because it turned out they didn't even accuse Clarice of stealing the bolt. So who the hell cares? Why was this even in the story? And then Luke and Percy, like, walk into the woods, and Percy kind of extremely easily figures out suddenly that Luke is a traitor. He literally just says, you know, Luke, there's this weird part of the prophecy that never came true. And then, like, he just says, you know, there was this part that said you will be betrayed by one who calls you friend. And then he looks at Luke like, oh my god, you're the traitor. And I'm like, well, what are you basing that on? Like, in the... In in the book, I compare it to the book a lot, but it's just because the book did it so much better. In the book, they're having a conversation where the way Luke's talking leads Percy to understand, wait a minute, you're the one on who was working with Cronus. In the show, though, Luke says freaking nothing, and Percy just immediately comes to that conclusion. Now, granted, yeah, you could say he figured it out because the shoes tried to pull him into Tartarus. But by that logic, wouldn't he have figured it out earlier? Why is he suddenly figuring it out now? Like, in the in the book, he figured that out after, you know, the other clues that Luke was dropping, that he was the lightning thief. There's no clues like that here. It, like, I don't know. I don't know. Percy just immediately assumes, oh, wait, you never told them the Clary's thing because you know she's not the thief. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, how how do you know that? <laughs> like, what what even brought that up? I, I, I don't get it. I don't fully get it. Um, But yeah, when it is revealed, then uh, Luke says, I want to recruit you, Percy. And I'm thinking, no, you don't. You tried to have him pulled down into Tartarus. <laughs> and uh, then there's this reveal that also wasn't in the book. Lukey why did I say Lukey? What a weird thing to say. Luke, he, that's why I said it. Luke, he pulls out a backbiter, which if you know from the books is a sword that's half bronze, half steel, so it can kill both people and monsters, because that's what Luke wants to do, I guess. And apparently in the show, uh, Backbiter the Sword has the power to open portals. And it's like, okay, not in the book, but it would help explain how he was able to steal items from the gods, and I'm guessing it'll be incorporated later to explain how Luke is getting all over the map. Um, that's one I have to wait and see to know what I really think of, but I don't really have an issue with it right now. There's also one change I actually liked. Um, when Luke reveals he's the traitor, it turns out Annabeth is there with them because she was wearing her invisible cap. And there's this moment where Luke sees that Annabeth now knows he's the traitor, and he looks really like like sad that she knows that and if you know like Annabeth and Luke's dynamic that makes sense actually and I think it's good to have Annabeth be a part of that because she has this history with Luke and their relationship is pretty important and yeah it's just um so so it did work I think it also would have worked if we had been able to see Annabeth's reaction when Percy, you know, tells her that Luke's the traitor. That could have been a, an opportunity to show some, like, interesting conflict there. But uh, I think this works, too. My only question is, why was Annabeth invisible in following them? What was to be gained? What, what was she trying to do? That's the only question I have. It's like, why did you turn invisible and start following them? What were, what were you doing? Um... Yeah, and uh, yeah, so if you know the book in instead, what, what, what happens is um, when Percy realizes Luke is the lightning thief, Luke then uses a mythical Greek scorpion to poison Percy, because I think he's just trying to kill him and then peace out. But then the dryads um, in the woods help Percy get to the camp. And that, uh, I think that would have been cool to see in the show. It's not really essential to have in the show, because they replaced it with the Annabeth slash Backbiter portal scene, which was also kind of cool. So I, I, I could, I could kind of give or take either of those scenes. I think it's cool in the book, and it's also perfectly good in the show. Um, but yeah, the only issue is I would have liked a better way to reveal that Luke is the Lightning Thief. And um, earlier in the episode, they had these flashback scenes where they show that Percy and Luke did train together. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, yeah, like, now we're finally showing it. I wanted it in episode two, but we're showing it now. Because in episode two, like, you had an opportunity to, to hint at Percy's Poseidon powers with the scene where he drinks a bottle of water, then immediately beats Luke in a fight. But they didn't do that. I would have liked that, but at least we got some of it here, so that was cool. There is one really dumb line, though. 
where when they're sword fighting, Percy's like, what's the point? When am I ever going to use this? It's like, dude, you just fought a Minotaur. Of course you're going to use this. What are you, dumb? And then literally his next line is saying, man, I just had to fight a Fury and a Minotaur. Like, it's been a rough week. And I'm like, yeah, you did. You fought a Fury and a Minotaur. So, of course, you need to learn how to sword fight. Why would you think you don't need to learn how to sword fight? That was a stupid line. That was a really dumb line. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one little nitpick. <laughs> um, um, one thing I also didn't really like is we don't get to see Percy's reunion with his mom. All we get is this weird dream sequence that then turns into a dream about Kronos, which, uh, you know, Kronos says, Percy, like, you're part of my plan, and I don't remember Percy being part of Kronos's plan in the books. I think, like, Sh I, Shane told me, like, there was a point in the books where Kronos wanted Percy to be his vessel. I don't remember that. Um, let me know if that's true. But I, if that's true, I get it. If not, I'm like, when would Percy be a part of Kronos's plan? But I don't know. If anything, per Percy's a constant thorn in Kronos's plan. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I wish we had gotten to see their reunion. I think it would have been nice. But I did like, uh, again, I like Percy and Sally's dynamic for the most, when it's not in th the damn flashbacks. I don't like the flashbacks. I like that we got the blue pancakes. That was fun. Like, one issue I had with the flashbacks before is I'm pretty sure in the book, like, Percy says, my mother never even so much as raised her voice at me, yet in the flashback she yells at him, like, three times. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I guess we don't get that. And, um, one thing this show never acknowledges is what happened to Gabe. Are Sally and Gabe still together? Did they kill him? <laughs> did, uh, or did they, did she kick him out? What happened? What was the point of Gabe? In this whole show, what was the point of Gabe? What did Gabe add? <laughs> like, you could have taken Gabe out of the show. Literally nothing would have changed. And some of you are going to say, well, you know, he has to be there for the smell, you know, thing. Yeah, but it's not... Like, Gabe... The purpose of Gabe in the book was mainly to show how much sacrifice Percy's mom is willing to make to keep Percy safe. To the point that she is literally with an abusive man who beats her. Like, but none of that's in the show. In the show, Gabe's just some silly loser who Sally can order around. And I really, I didn't like that. I Yeah, I know people are like, oh, it's Disney. They're never going to show an abusive relationship. Well, then don't even include him. Just cut him out. What's the point of teasing us like that? One reason I, one reason that the Gabe story really resonated with me as a kid is I grew up with an abusive father who, you know, did things to my mother and to me, and to my brother. And so when I got to that part of the book, it hit me hard when it was revealed what Gabe had been doing. And, you know, what ends up happening to him is very satisfying. So, you know, um, I just, I think that's important. I think it, it resonates with kids who are going through stuff like that, because it did with me. So for me personally, it, it just sucks that they completely neutered that entire storyline. Why was he even in the show? What did he add? What was the point? I saw no points in Gabe throughout this damn show. Uh, just like how Grover was made completely useless, Gabe was made completely pointless. <sighs> so, but again, like, I've said a lot of nice things about the episode. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be fair here. I'm trying to say the good and the bad. Some people say I'm being so unfair to this show. You know, I go out of my way to try to say something nice about every episode. I think I'm being very fair to this show. Ah, <sighs> jeez. And, um, yeah, you know, but overall this episode left me in a good mood, whereas the last episode left me in a bad mood because of how horribly Hades was done. But yeah, see, if, if all the episodes, like I said, had left me in the mood that this episode left me with, I think this would have been a very enjoyable series. They're, like, the pace didn't feel rushed here. The gods didn't feel completely out of character here. And, you know, there... Like, there were changes, but I understood most of the changes in this episode. Again, I love the Edge as Ares. He's having a ton of fun. He's my favorite character in the show currently, which uh, makes me sad because I know he's only the most predominant in the first book, so I don't think we're going to see much more of him, which is sad because I love him. I love him as Ares. Uh, by the way, Hades looks nothing like he does in the credits for this show. In the credits, they show a very myth-accurate Hades. And then in the show, he's just, yeah, nothing like that. 
<sighs> so th th that's my thoughts on the episode. I would actually give this episode on its own an eight. And uh, Shane and Claire agreed with me on that. This was a very entertaining episode. A lot of fun. I laughed a few times. And I was enjoying seeing how they brought those parts of the book to life. And when they brought in the change, like the backbiter change, I was like, that's an intriguing change. Let's let's see how that goes. Like, it wasn't a change that made me go, ah, oh, you know, it, it, because it didn't it didn't feel like it was taking away from something. It felt like they were adding something. But there were still problems, like the Luke reveal and that stupid line, when am I ever going to use this? And, um, you know, just the the fact that while Lance Reddick is fantastic, there was almost no effort made to make him look like Greek Zeus. And I wish there had been some more of that. <sighs> so, but this episode on its own, I would give an 8 out of 10 to. Now, since the series, not the series, the season is over, what would I give the overall season? Well... Recap of my thoughts. I thought the first two episodes were way too rushed. I thought the third episode was very disjointed and annoying. I thought the fourth episode was decent. I thought the fifth episode was pretty good. I thought the sixth episode was terrible. And I thought the seventh episode was anger-inducing. And I really enjoyed the eighth episode. So if you hear all that... Most of the episodes I didn't like, but there were three I had an okay time with. Look, before this episode, I was at a four out of ten for the whole show. But this one was good enough, and the fact that it's the finale, I think that's worth giving a whole point. So I'm going to give this show a five out of ten. And I think that's pretty, like, it's pretty accurate to how I feel about the show. It's very mid. Um... Again, I don't fully understand if, like, it sounds like a lot of adults enjoy the show. I don't fully understand. If this show feels very focused on kids who did not read the books. Um, I don't understand when people say this show is such a love letter to fans. I don't get it. Um, but you're welcome to explain to me why. Um, people have told me, like, when I've said bad things about the show, they've said, you're an adult, why are you even watching it? Well, I'm watching it because I read the books as, as a kid, and now I'm grown up. The first book came out 18 years ago, guys, and it was a huge hit. I think it's fair to say that a lot of Percy Jackson fans are over 18 now. That's how math works. That's why I watch the show. And some people are like, oh, you're, 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 you're overthinking it. Why can't you just sit back and enjoy it? Oh, because... Because I have a brain. I'm sorry. I'm not the scarecrow. I have a brain. My brain is the thing I use to enjoy media. So that means it's going to be on when I watch media. And I'm going to think about media. And people keep saying, why are you comparing it to the books? Because it's an adaptation of the books. Why would I not compare it to that? Should we not compare Disney remakes to the things they're remaking? Um, people who say all the changes were for the better. That's a really weird blanket statement to make. Come on, can you honestly sit there and tell me that every change was for the better? When you say that, it sounds like you're not thinking about what you're saying, and you're just mad and trying to deflect any criticism that happens. And again, most importantly, your thoughts don't have to be my thoughts. The show is wildly successful and getting very nice reviews. I think it's fair to say there will be more seasons no matter what I think of it. And by the way, I have nothing against Rick Riordan, even if he was the cause of every problem I have with this show, because he still created something that really resonated with me and really meant a lot to me, and he still continues to create stuff I really enjoy. The most recent thing he's written that I fully finished was the Trials of Apollo series, and I had a lot of fun with that series. So, yeah. And, and another thing is when people say my, all of my criticisms are invalid because... Rick signed off on the show and helps out with the show. They're like, well, if Rick likes it, then it is automatically good. Okay, do you guys like the Fantastic Beasts movies then? Because J.K. Rowling signed off on all of that. And I'm pretty sure two out of three of those are freaking terrible. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, come on, guys. Let's just be civil with each other. If you enjoy the show, that's wonderful. But if you don't enjoy the show, that's valid. I think there are plenty of reasons not to enjoy the show. And even if it is more accurate than the movies, that doesn't automatically make it good. There's still a lot of changes here, and it's going to annoy certain people that want it to be closer than the books. This show was constantly promoted as being really close to the books. So it's just, 
of course people are going dis to be disappointed when it isn't. And of course, Hades, who is my favorite Greek god and a lot of people's favorite Greek god, when he shows up and is absolutely 100% nothing like he is in the books, aside from one single thing that he's not the villain of the story, people are going to have a problem with that. Is that your only standard for Hades, that he not be the villain? Do you sit there and go, so long as he's the villain, I love him. Even if he's a literal freaking minion from Despicable Me, I'll still love him. <laughs> when you adapt something, people still expect it to feel like the same story or like feel like the story has come to life. That's what people are going to want when there is an adaptation. I don't think that's an unfair thing for people to want. And I think like the biggest problem with all these changes they've made to Hades' personality, just this easygoing, I don't care about anything personality, is it's not gonna fit in with the arc Hades is supposed to have in future stories. I mean, I'm guessing, I guess they're not doing that arc at all anymore, because how are they gonna do it? Like. Hades in the books is supposed to be viscerally angry at Zeus and, like, his family for, like, killing a woman he cared very deeply about and nearly killing his two kids, straight up attempting to murder his two children. Are we going to have that? Because the Hades in this doesn't feel like he's gone through that at all. Also, the curse on the Oracle is supposed to have come directly from Hades in this, like, very intense scene in the books which again I don't see this Hades being able to do at all but it seems like the oracle is cursed like it was in the books from that scene earlier on and again that scene I didn't like that that scene was trying so hard to be funny instead of creepy the scene with the oracle it felt kind of ridiculous so how how are they going to say that the curse happened are they still going to show the scene of Hades doing it because I don't know how that would work here and like how are they just it just, it breaks some storylines that I really, really like from the books, and I, I, I don't know. Oh, one thing I liked, by the way, that I forgot to mention was that Grover's Searcher's license is a flower, because that feels very nature -y, and Grover's entire existence is very nature -y. But yeah, I think that's really about all I have to say about this series. I'm gonna make a video on why I connected with the books so much, because it seems like a lot of people don't understand why I... I like the books so much and why I, they, they're still important to me as an adult. People seem to have this attitude of, you're an adult, so whatever young adult thing you read shouldn't matter to you anymore. I don't know why you would have that idea. I'm sure we've all had stuff we've enjoyed in our childhood that still means a lot to us as an adult. But yeah, I'll make something about that. But feel free to let me know your thoughts on the show. Are you someone who really loves the show? Do you agree with what I'm saying? Do you disagree with what I'm saying? I'm still happy to hear you out, even if I don't agree with you. Or, like, are you, like, someone who really hates the show? And does this feel like your only place to go to hate it? <laughs> because people keep saying no other YouTuber dislikes the show like I do. So, I, you know what? I take that as a badge of honor. I, th I think I'm a nice little uh, unique place here on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I don't know how to end videos.